Hello everyone from Donovetch team. Welcome to today's webinar, Immersive Visualization and Virtual Reality with Autodesk. Virtual reality and immersive experiences are game-changing technologies that bring a whole new dimension to visualization. Today, Jose Lizardo will walk us through the live design family of products and services from Autodesk, which includes 3ds Max, the Stingray Game Engine, and Revit Live 2018. Jose Manuel Elizardo is a member of the media and entertainment team at Autodesk and is a recognized visualization expert and industry thought leader. Jose has over 13 years of product and, this, and industry experience. But before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's needs. So we, you need the software for design, chances are we have it. Uh, so check us out at novage.com. And also you can follow us on the usual on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, we're all over the place coming up. In two weeks, industrial design and reverse engineering in SOLIDWORKS with award-winning power surfacing, RE. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded live. And if you want to rewatch this or any other webinar in our collection, just add on over to Novage's YouTube and Vimeo channel. And now I'm gonna pass the screen to Jose Manuel. So, he can really um, take the stage. Thank you for that intro. Just uh, just to confirm, do you see my screen properly? We do. All right, awesome. So thank you. Awesome. All right, so thank you so much for that intro, and thanks for inviting me here today to talk to you guys about VR and immersive visualization. My name is uh, Jose Elizardo. I'm a member of the Media and Entertainment Group at Autodesk. Um, and so we're going to talk today a lot about, of course, immersive visualization virtual reality and the live design ecosystem, if you will, from, uh, from Autodesk. So I'm gonna jump right in. Actually, before I do jump in, I have about 50, 52 minutes of content, and I'm gonna stay to the top of the hour to answer questions or uh, have uh, more comments. If you guys have comments, I will be here to, uh, to address those. All right, so just a quick look at my agenda. So we're gonna talk about 3ds Max, of course, um, and Stingray, the game engine. If you're not familiar with Stingray, Stingray is a game engine, much like Unity, much like Unreal. Um, and we have really good uh, workflows between 3ds Max and Stingray, and so we're gonna talk a lot about that here today. Of course, also virtual reality and Revit Live. So the first announcement that I want to make is that Stingray, if, you're, if you've been following at all, some of our uh, work, Stingray is now being bundled with 3ds Max. So this announcement happened about a month ago, um, and if you are a subscriber of 3ds Max, you will have access to uh, Stingray the game engine for free. So whether you're a 3ds Max subscriber or a collection subscriber, you will have access to uh, the Stingray game engine for free. Just one second. Um, and the other announcement that I want to make is that we've rebranded and renamed the Stingray game engine to uh, Max Interactive. So, uh, you know, under the hood, it's the exact same thing. It's the Stingray game engine. Uh, but it has been renamed and rebranded to uh, Max Interactive. Just give me one second here. All right, so sorry about that. I had a little technical issue there to deal with. All right, so let's jump right in and talk about this uh, Max Interactive workflow with uh, 3ds Max. So jumping right in, this uh, this video here that I'm about to play back is captured directly from the Stingray and or, you know, I'm going to be calling it Stingray sometimes or Max Interactive, but it is basically um, the Stingray game engine. And I like to show this uh, particular video because it showcases two things really nicely. One, the visual quality that you can produce where you can get out of Stingray Game Engine is really, really high, right? So it's all PBR based, physically based shading, physically based rendering, um, really great light baking that we can do. Um, and the other thing is that it's fully uh, interactive and fully immersive and fully explorable environment. Don't mind the dancing man in the bathroom. He is a, uh, a good uh, Easter egg in my, uh, in my demos. Um, um, Jose, sorry, we yeah. are, we're still seeing your main slide. We're not um, getting through the video. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Hmm. So you see the uh, the title slide, right? 
we see a slide uh, yes all right let me see if I can solve this really quickly go back into here go here we should be able to see this close that yes we let see it here. now yeah you see it now and if I we switch do. slides you yes. see my agenda Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, finally, on... did you know? Okay. I'm Thank so sorry you. about that. I was sharing the uh, the wrong uh, <laughs> the wrong screen on my go-to. No um, problem. So let's keep going. All right. So back to the video that I was showing. This is an example of an interactive visualization that you can produce out of a game engine like Stingray. And I, like I was saying earlier, I like to show this because it showcases two things really well. One is the visual quality that you can produce out of, uh, out of Stingray. So this is very high quality, very high quality rendering, all real time. It's all PBR based, really great light baking, really great post screen effects too, like blooms and screen space AO and screen space reflections. Um, and also the, um, the ability to completely walk around and explore this model. Right, so you're not limited to uh, just a static image from a single point of view or you know, a rendered, pre-rendered sequence. You can actually completely walk around the space, go anywhere you want, see anything you want from any angle that you want. That is really the value of immersive visualization and immersive, um, immersive experiences. Um, oops, went a little bit too quickly there. Um, and so, so I'm just gonna keep playing back this video here to show you guys some of the things you can do in an immersive experience or in an immersive or interactive visualization. So it's not just, of course, about, um, it's not just about um, visual quality and you know being able to explore things and walk around, but it's also the ability to change things on the fly, make modifications and see how those modifications will affect you know the overall the overall space. In this case here, when we approach specific objects that I can interact with, they turn blue to tell me that um, I can interact with them. In this case here, we're turning on and off the lights and we can see how that lighting will affect the space overall. This is how I've programmed this experience. This is one of many ways that you can program a, an interactive visualization experience. Here we're changing the floors. I particularly like this, this floor shade or this floor material looks really, really good. Again, just various different examples of the different kinds of things that you can do in an interactive uh, an interactive space, an interactive world, if you will. So let's keep going here. Let's take a look at the workflow for actually producing this. So this, of course, started off as a Revit scene that was brought into 3ds Max, originally designed for V-Ray rendering. So if you're an architect attending this 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 webinar, or you know if you're doing any kind of, of architectural visualization, chances are you're using V-Ray. It is an industry leading you know, renderer for, for architectural visualizations. Um, and the really great thing about the Stingray game engine or Max Interactive is that we support V-Ray, Max V-Ray scenes out of the box. So all of your V-Ray scenes that are already set up for V-Ray rendering, you can take those and throw them right into Stingray and you should be able to get going you know, pretty fast um, out of the box, get up and running really quickly. So this particular scene here, like I said, is a V-Ray scene. So I'm just gonna let this play back here. Um, we have V-Ray materials all across the scene, the V-Ray, uh, you know, standard material. Um, we have V-Ray lights in here as well. And what I'm going to do is go to the Stingray menu. Give me one more second. I have to solve one last thing before I can continue with this presentation. So sorry about this. I got to turn this guy on and come in here and we can keep going. All right. So what I'm going to do is from the scene, I'm going to go to the Stingray menu up on top of the main uh, title menu here, title bar, and we're gonna go to uh, Level Send All. Level Send All will allow me to pick and choose what I want to send to Stingray, uh, to the game engine from 3ds Max. We have our materials, we have our texture maps, we have of course our meshes, our lights, and our cameras. The really great thing, the really important thing to note here is the last item on this list, generate UVs for light baking. Light baking is a really critical and crucial part of any real-time architectural or any real-time um, experience that you that, that you would make for any purpose, whether it's visualization, whether it's games, whether it's anything. Everything in real time has to be baked. Everything in real time has to run fast and for performance reasons, for things to run at 60 frames per second, you wanna make sure that you are baking anything that you can. This, that applies also to lighting. So you never want to keep lights dynamically uh, you know, activated in the sense that they're always calculating at every frame. You wanna bake that lighting down uh, to your meshes so that you are not calculating lighting every frame or else you can never run at 60 frames per second, uh, which is you know, the minimum requirement for, for most, uh, most platforms. 
Um, and to generate uh, light baking, your meshes, your objects themselves, need to have what we call a secondary set of UVs, UV coordinates. Typically, you do that manually. You can unwrap your objects, give them a secondary UV channel. Um, but what Stingray also has is an automatic unwrapper, and we can uh, we can access that automatic unwrapper directly from 3ds Max when sending our assets into Stingray. Um, and of course, the process of doing so can be a little bit long because it's going to unwrap every single object, but the inverse, doing it manually, is can be hours and days of work. So where this might take an hour to send this into Stingray uh, because it's unwrapping every object, you're saving literally days of work. Um, so we keep going here. We basically send everything. We're going to put these two guys side by side so we see what happens when I hit the send button of course this is dramatically sped up for the purposes of the presentation but this process probably took about an hour to send everything over into stingray again saving you days of work um, and what it's going to do it's actually going to recreate the entire level completely and it's going to have all my secondary UVs and all of my materials are going to come through because it supports sphere materials and within maybe an hour's worth of work I have an entire level that is completely rebuilt based on my maxing. This in itself is the, 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 the heart and soul of what makes this workflow so, so powerful with 3ds Max and Stingray. From 3ds Max, I can turn on camera tracking, which basically links the Stingray camera to the 3ds Max camera. So I navigate in one, in one viewport or in one product, I see the exact same viewing point from the other product and vice versa. By the way, I can go into Max Navigate and I see the same thing in Stingray. And all of my assets are individual assets, right? It didn't export my entire scene as one big blob of geometry, which used to be the case in, in earlier workflows of this, uh, earlier versions of these of this workflow. Now, in the most recent versions, it actually exports every single individual unit as an individual asset with the correct pivot points and the correct handles. Uh, so if I want to make changes, of course, into Max, I simply move the, move the, make the changes that I want to make and then send those changes over into Stingray. The other thing that Stingray supports from 3ds Max is instances. So this is a really important thing. Everything in a game engine is about performance. You want to reduce, you know, reduce anything that takes too long to calculate, increase performance at every corner that you that you can um, and instancing is one way to solve that um, stingray has always supported instancing but it never supported max's instancing until recently so i have this chair here in max and i'm going to go ahead and just create a few instances of it and i'm going to randomize their location a little bit their position and their rotation just a little bit i'm going to select all of these chairs and go back to the stingray menu and I'm going to go level sense selected this time, not the entire scene, just what is selected. And in this panel, I'm going to make sure that update existing assets is disabled. What this is going to do, it's basically going to send the positional and rotational information only of each instance and send that into Stingray. And Stingray itself will instance the chair within its project. And this process that just happened really quickly, that was not sped up. That literally took half a second because all it's sending is positional and rotational information. If I select any one of these chairs in Stingray and I locate its asset in the project browser, I see that they're all pointing to the same chair. I don't have eight copies of this chair. I have one chair that's being instanced eight times. That's a big distinction to make. It's a little bit nuanced, but it's a really important distinction to make. Um, so we keep going here. We can add more assets. I'm going to use uh, the 3ds Max asset library to get assets that I have on, on my hard drive. This is an external product. If you don't have it, it's for free. It's available on the Apps Exchange Store. It works with 3ds Max, and it's basically a way of gathering uh, your libraries of assets that you may have either locally or on network drives and have them in one convenient space. So we have these folders here that contain my my assets themselves. We have these nice large thumbnails to, to view these assets with. Uh, lots of metadata assigned to these assets. You see here on the right hand side, when I select the radio, for example, I see all of the metadata associated with this radio. I have a path to the actual location on disk. I can remap dependencies from here. If I had missing textures, I don't have to open up Max. I can do it all from here. Um, and if I want to bring these assets into Max, there's lots of different ways of doing that. I can merge them in, which is what we're about to do, but I can also replace assets uh, from within, uh, from Max, from with objects from the asset library. I can object paint them in, I can xref them in, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So this here we're going to drag and drop the radio, push it into our Mac scene, and we're going to select in place to position it on the ottoman really quickly using the Y key. 
And then from here, what I can do again, just like I did with the chairs and the rest of the scene, I'm going to go Stingray, level send, it sends over the radio. This radio also was set up for V-Ray rendering, so it's got all V-Ray materials with diffuse maps and bump maps and glossiness maps and roughness maps, and all of those maps came through as you see here. Everything has been maintained. I can turn on and off the individual maps to see what this looks like, but the entire radio and all of its integrity came in with one click. So the next uh, thing I like to do here, and, and, and you know, just to kind of reiterate what's going on or kind of take a step back here, you know, we started from nothing. We had a scene in Max and we had nothing in Stingray. And I like to show this because it shows how to go from nothing to pretty much everything or, you know, to a really nice looking visualization in really straightforward and intuitive and relatively simple steps. Uh, so the first step, of course, is bringing our geometry in. The next logical step in all this is to bake down the lighting. Right now it looks all a little bit flat. It's reflecting weird things. We're going to solve all that. Uh, so Stingray has a really powerful light baker. It's GPU based. So the better the, G the GPU you have, the faster this uh, process will take or the, will go. Um, and it's based on a, a couple of, there's, you know, there's a few settings in here, but the two most important ones I would say are the first and the second, the light map resolution and the total sample passes. Uh, basically, this is a progressive refinement solution. So it's going to progressively calculate the light bake um, bent, depending on the amount of passes that you give it. So if you want it, you want it to, if you want to have a noise-free or grainless solution, you give it more passes. Um, uh, so of course, the more passes you give it, the longer it will refine for, the, the, the better, the cleaner the solution will be. And your light map resolution is basically how big do you want these light maps that are going to be calculated to be. Uh, so the bigger that number, the bigger they will be, the more quality they will have, right? So they'll have more detail in them, but they will also be longer to calculate. And so they'll take longer to refine and they will, they will be heavier on the graphics card on runtime. So when you play back your scene or you got try to, you know, uh, to, to walk around and, and explore, uh, you need to have a better graphics card to be able to support those larger light maps. The default settings for this particular project are good enough. So I'm going to hit go and notice everything turns black. So this is basically what's happening. It's progressively calculating that those light maps for each individual object. I can visualize my light map resolution using this viewport display called light map texels. This basically shows me the resolution of the light maps using this black and white checker pattern. And also this tells me if I have any problems with my secondary UVs, if I have any stretched UVs, for example, um, I can see that issue. Uh, I can detect those issues using this kind of uh, this viewport filter. Um, what we can also do is, uh, you know, in the light baking panel, the light map resolution setting at 30 right now is a global setting for every asset in the scene. Um, if I wanted to individually tweak uh, the light map resolution for specific objects that might be in the foreground, I might want them to have a higher resolution and objects in the background, a slightly lower resolution or objects that are unimportant, for example, might have a lower resolution. I can change the resolution on a per object basis as well. So I can grab this radio, for example, and I can go to its parameters and say, hey, my light map resolution, I'm going to double this to two. So now when I re-render, re-bake, um, it reduces that or increases that resolution by sh making the squares a bit smaller. It's basically how to, how to look at that. We can also visualize the actual light map solution itself. So stripping away all of the textures, all the diffuse information, all of the light or the uh, reflection information, get rid, of it, get rid of all that and just look at your, your, your light maps or your baked lighting solution. This is what it currently looks like. And this is progressively refining. Now this particular point of the video here is sped up to showcase what is happening over time. But this is what you would let refine for, you know, depending how long it would take until you have a clean solution. This particular project took about an hour and a half to refine to a clean light lighting solution. And what you see here is the result of that uh, one and a half hours of calculation time. So now that we've got light baking in, well, we've got our assets in first, of course. Then we bake the lighting on those assets. The next thing to do is, is handle reflections. Just like lighting, you want to bake your reflections down as much as possible. You don't want to calculate reflections in real time um, or because you wouldn't be able to run in real time. Uh, so we do that in Stingray using something called light probes. So we go to the create panel. We have uh, an object here that's called a reflection probe. So we're going to put this into our scene. 
and we are going to just position it, you know, uh, depending on the size and the space, there's lots of ways of adjusting these, but for the purposes of this particular space here, these two in the living room and in the kitchen are good enough. Um, and we're gonna go to the Windows uh, menu item there, go to lighting and say bake reflection probes. And this is gonna go ahead and take those probes, look around each of the probes and see what, it, see what the probes see and create uh, those reflection maps on all of the reflected surfaces in the scene around them. Uh, and you see, notice that just that one click, one reflection pro bake, and things start to look a lot better. We have nice, much nicer reflections. It's actually reflecting the things around them, not the sky in the background. The curtains are being reflected on the ground, the sofa as well, the kitchen countertop, et cetera, et cetera. So much nicer results, much better results uh, in terms of reflections just by adding those two uh, reflection probes. Uh, the next step, the next thing that I like to do when I'm creating these visualizations is to start uh, tweaking the default shading environment entity in Stingray. Every project in Stingray has one. This is where all of your, uh, you know, your, your ambient occlusion effects, your depth of field, your motion blur, your bloom, um, all of those settings are found in here. We call these post screen effects for the most part, but they're all found, they're all found in this one, uh, this one entity here, this one node here. Uh, so we can change, for example, our environment map the default environment map of stingray is a is a uh, is a sky map uh, we can change that to something that makes a bit more sense for the space for example an image of downtown LA for example um, and we can increase the brightness of that image by messing around with our sky dome intensity right now we have bloom turned on so everything kind of blows out a little bit we can adjust those settings as well so we have uh, uh, settings to adjust the bloom effect directly from within here a little bit of bloom is always welcome uh, the next thing we like to do, that I like to do, is go back to my global lighting. This is where you can adjust uh, the intensity of the things you've baked. For example, my reflection tint will increase those reflections with the brightness of those reflections that I baked using those, those reflection probes a little bit earlier. So if I think my reflections are a little too dim, I can increase the value here to uh, pump those up a bit or boost those up a bit. Same thing with baked diffuse tints. Uh, my lighting solution that I baked a little bit earlier, if I want to increase the brightness of that uh, of that effect or of that result, I can use my baked diffuse tint here to increase the overall lighting of the scene or brighten up the scene a little bit. What we also have is uh, tone mapping or exposure control. Anyone who's doing any kind of rendering with you know any render, V-Ray, Mental Ray, Arnold, you name it, uh, is familiar with exposure control. Uh, we always need a bit of exposure control to, to tone down or tone map our, our scenes. Stingray has exposure control, but it also has an automatic exposure control, which is really cool. So we're gonna go ahead and add that guy in, and this basically reacts to where you are in the scene and the lighting conditions of where you are found. So if I go, for example, into this darker area here under the sofa, uh, it adjusts the exposure to uh, compensate for the lighting or the lack of lighting in the space, but of course it bl blows out the background that's a little bit, you know, that was already brighter. Uh, so this, you know, this automatic exposure is pretty common in most uh, most video games that you would play out there that are based on most modern uh, most modern day game engines. Uh, Stingray also has the, those capabilities. Uh, we have ambient occlusion. This is screen spaced uh, ambient occlusion that we can uh, turn on. We can also visualize this screen space AO as a pass on the viewport. So therefore, removing everything else and just showing the AO. So we can turn that on and we can see exactly what the AO is looking like as we adjust our settings. This is a really good way to, to uh, make accurate adjustments to AO. And then when you come back to the full render, of course, it just comps that over on top of your uh, the rest of your effects. Uh, so lots of settings in here to adjust that. We also have screen space reflections. This is really, really important. This combined with baked reflections make really help bring your project to life in my opinion. So where baked reflections are gonna look at the overall objects around you and bake the overall, you know, those overall objects onto your reflected objects. Screen space reflections will actually look at objects in close contact to one another and reflect each other. So it's real time, this is calculating real time reflections. It's not like ray trace reflections, but it is still real time. And so there is a cost associated with calculating reflections in real time, you need to be wary of. So if you're doing anything with VR, if VR is your output, depending on your graphics cards, 
this is the kind of stuff where you want to start gauging and adjusting. And there's ways in Stingray to gauge how much performance you're gaining or losing with a particular setting. You can actually go in and really look at the fine tune exactly what, uh, what is costing you the most. But just keep in mind that most of these effects on a default shading environment entity, like screen space AO and screen space reflections, these are effects that will uh, affect performance for sure because they are being calculated in real time. But you see how this affects the overall look. It helps things you know, tremendously uh, by uh, having objects reflect one another. It really just brings everything to life. All right, so uh, we also have, of course, uh, depth of field. I particularly like to add a little bit of depth of field to my projects. Uh, it's really intuitive. Stingray's depth of field, you basically define uh, a focal region and focal distance, and you, you define how how much things are blurred in the background versus the foreground. It's very straightforward, it's very intuitive, it's very easy to use. All right, so up until now, we've seen how to get content into Stingray, you know, slash Max Interactive from 3ds Max. Um, and now let's take a look at how to bring in animations because it's one thing to make things look good, but you want, of course, the whole point of going into real time is to add interactivity, add behaviors, add animations, and trigger those animations. That's the whole fun part of, of, of game engines. Uh, so we're gonna use a very simple example of a door that is animated, and we're going to bring that animated door into Stingray slash Max Interactive and see how we could trigger those animations. So if I scrub my timeline here, you'll notice that from frame 0 to 100, the door opens, or closes rather, and then from frame uh, 100 to 200, the inverse happens. These, these animations are typically called animation clips uh, when two animations are found on the same timeline. Um, this is very typical of game workflows, or if you had a character that you were sending into a game engine, the character might you know, have a walk cycle, a run cycle, a crouch cycle, a falling cycle. All of those cycles or, the, or, or those animations would be found on the same timeline. And you'd want to divide those up as animation clips. The exact same principle applies to anything else, for example, these animated doors. So we wanna send these two clips, the door opening and the door closing, individually. To do that, inside of Max, we have a tool that is called the Games Exporter. So if I come to the Max uh, uh, application button and I go to Export, and then I go to Export Games Exporter, this is the utility that uh, will allow you to do this. Uh, so we're going to define what we're ex exporting. We're exporting our selection. We're going to define the two clips, right? So door opening and door closing and the appropriate frame range for each, 0 to 100 and 101 to 200. We're going to give it a path on disk and a file name, and then we're gonna hit export. We're also gonna make sure that we're saving this to a single FBX file. This is really, really important. This makes things so much cleaner and so much easier to handle. This one FBX file will contain all the information we need to be able to use this door and its animations inside of Stingray. So we're gonna go ahead and just save that out. This is the door FBX file that uh, we just exported. So to bring this into Stingray, a slightly different way of bringing data in that, than, than we saw a little bit earlier with the Ascend Selection and, and uh, Level Sync and level, level, uh, level, level Sync All, Level Sync Selected. So this time we're going to take our door.fbx and we're going to drag and drop it into our Stingray project browser. Doing so prompts the import dialog from Stingray. In here we can select the things we want to import that are found on this FBX file, the mesh, the materials, animations, just like we had with uh, the options inside of 3ds Max. It's the exact same, uh, it's the exact same uh, uh, thing that's happening under the hood. Uh, so we're going to make sure that animation is enabled because we know we have animation on this, uh, on this mesh, and we are going to make sure our clips are being imported, and just like that, everything comes through. We have our door mesh that we can preview in the asset preview window. We can bring it into our project uh, and line it up so it lines up to the same location as Max. We have our two animations, door opening and door closing. We can play those back in the asset preview to see what they look like. And then we have, of course, the materials assigned to the store, uh, glass, uh, glass rough and metal windows. Uh, so once we got the door in the project, it's in the viewport, it's inside of the engine. Now, what do we do with this? Well, I want to uh, trigger those animations when something happens. Uh, to do this kind of behavior, typically you use scripting in game engines. Uh, some other game engines like Unreal have something called Blueprint, which is basically a node-based version of scripting that allows you to do these kinds of interactions and behaviors. Stingray also has something called Flow. It's very similar to Unreal's Blueprint. Uh, Flow is node-based, 
and it allows you to connect things together and basically program out behaviors and logic uh, rather than using scripting. If you wanted to use scripting and then you can extend flow with scripting if you are at all into that world. I'm not a scripter nor a programmer, so I stick to flow. Um, but if you want to script in Stingray, the scripting language is Lua. Lua is very similar to Python. It's very common in the games industry. Um, and all of this stuff that you see here in flow, all these nodes that we're about to create and connect, they're all based on uh, Lua. They're all Lua scripts. You can actually just take a node, copy it, literally control C into Windows clipboard, go to notepad and paste and you'll get the code, uh, the Lua code for that node. So it's all Lua based. Uh, so uh, just like everything in Flow, we need a node representation, uh, a node version of whatever is inside of our scene. In this case here, our doors are being represented as this green node called level unit. So this node that you see here is basically the door. Um, and we need a couple of other nodes to play those animations. We're going to add a play animation clip node. We're going to set its loop to false, and we're going to create a copy of this, one for the door opening, one for the door closing. The next thing to do is assign these nodes to those animation clips that we imported a little bit earlier. So we're going to go ahead and just assign those. And then we're going to tell these nodes or these animations to play on the door. So pretty straightforward what's happening here. We have um, we have animation clips that know that they need to be played on the door mesh. That's basically what we've done here. But like everything in a game engine, you need to set up an event or when will this happen, a trigger of some sort. Lots of different ways of doing this, lots of different behaviors that you may or may not want to create. I'm gonna go super simple and just create a volume trigger. So I'm gonna draw out this yellow box in front of my door. And as you probably guessed it, this door or this box basically represents a volume that says, hey, when I'm inside this volume, make something happen. When I step outside of this volume, make something else happen. Uh, so we're gonna bring our volume trigger into flow and we're gonna connect this up. We're gonna say, hey, when I touch the volume trigger, play the door opening. When I untouch the volume trigger, play the door closing. When I want to test this out and see what this actually behaves like or what the behavior of this will feel like in game or in experience, I can hit the play button, green play button on the upper left hand side of the screen. And this will play test my level. So let's go ahead and just do that and see that I'm a person, I'm a character, I'm walking around, I'm colliding with things. When I approach the door, it opens. When I walk away, it closes. So a very simple example of how to set up animations, but that's basically what you do for most of the things you want to do. It's, and then the event and how that animation is triggered is really up to you. There's lots of different ways you can set it up with keyboard key buttons if you wanted to, or controller buttons, or lots of different ways. Another workflow that I want to show you is how to reuse assets from one project to another. Um, so in this case here, for example, this chair, if I wanted to reuse it in another project, what I would do is I would right click on it and I would say find the asset in the project browser. It would locate it in the Stingray project browser and now I can visualize it with the little asset preview window there. Um, and when I right click on the leather chair itself, I have options in here. One of those is to export the asset. What this will do when I hit export asset is it will, it will take the mesh, the object itself, all of its textures, all of its animations, all of its dependencies, whatever is associated to that mesh, and it's gonna wrap it into a very convenient zip file. And that zip file can be used in any project, in any Stingray project. So that's really one great, one really great way of setting up something once and not having to do it again you know, many, many times. So I'm gonna show you how to import this once you've exported it out. Um, so we come to the import button and we locate a zip. I have the ceiling fan zip uh, that I exported from another project that I'm gonna bring into this project. And I'm gonna say open. And all of its dependencies are listed out here. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, hit import. And when I locate that fan on disk, I will see that I will have everything that is associated with that fan. I have the fan mesh itself, the materials, the textures, and the animations of the fan spinning. All right, now I can take the fan and drag it into my project, and now it's ready to be used. Now, if I want to set up that animation, uh, that you know, the fan spinning, I showed you how to do animations with flow. There's another method of doing animations or setting up animations in Stingray called animation controllers. It's a slightly more sophisticated way of setting up more complex animations if you wanted to blend between animations. For example, I come back, I come back to the character because it's really the best example to illustrate this. But if you had a character that's running and then walks and you want to blend between the walking and the running, you would use animation controllers. I'm going to use it just to play back the animation spinning, uh, the fan spinning to illustrate how it works. Uh, and the really great thing about animation controllers too is that they actually play back 
in engine, in the viewport here, um, unlike flow, which only uh, triggers things when you actually execute the level, when you hit the, the play test button. So if I want my fan to continuously be spinning inside of my viewport, I would use an animation controller to do that. So to create an animation controller, I'm gonna right click on my ceiling fan skeleton, and I'm gonna say create an animation controller. Um, give it a name, of course. And then we double click on the little running guy controller there. We have an empty node that comes with every animation controller. I'm just going to scrap it, click on it, and delete, and right-click and say create a new clip state. This clip state allows me to connect to an animation clip uh, that, that I might want to connect onto this fan. Uh, in my case here, it's the fan spinning. So we're going to go ahead and just assign that ceiling fan. Um, and if I wanted to, I can increase or decrease the speed at which this animation is playing back using playback rate that's currently set to 1. Um, if I wanted to play back faster, I would, of course, increase and slower, I would decrease it. Um, save this out, and now my fan is playing back. It's spinning in the viewport. Something else we could do, and this is quite powerful, I can take an asset from Stingray, uh, for example, this fan. We're going to stick with the fan for now. And I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to say Send to 3ds Max. This will send the asset and its animations and its textures into 3ds Max, where I can make adjustments and then push those adjustments back into Stingray. So the whole workflow is back and forth. It's Stingray to Max, it's Max to Stingray. The whole ecosystem works really, really well. So it gets pushed into 3ds Max. You see we have our fan. If I just adjust my timeline here really quickly to get the right frame range, you see that when I scrub my timeline, my fan is spinning. So let's go ahead and make an adjustment. I'm gonna make a bogus adjustment to this fan. I'm gonna add four propellers. Of course, this doesn't really exist, but the point is to show you that we're changing the fan itself. And we're gonna go back to Stingray. This time we're gonna say update. And it's asking if I wanna override the file in the Stingray project, I'm gonna say yes. And just like that, it updates to eight propellers. Now, what just happened there? It's pretty significant because that fan is in engine. It's in all in real time. It's playing back an animation. And I basically went under Stingray's feet and removed everything associated to that fan while it's reading the fan data. And it just took it all in and kept going. That's quite powerful. It's a really, really, really robust system. Um, and it just works really well. So uh, I hope you guys like that. All right, so now that we've kind of gone through the gamut of the workflow, there's lots, of course, that can be shown. Um, but we only have an hour together, so I'm going to keep going. All right, so uh, I, I wanted to show you guys some other examples of you know actual customer projects that have uh, gone through this process. You know that's that data set that you saw there. That 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 uh, project was you know internally built, and uh, it's one of our kind of our testing projects. This is an actual data set from a company called Neoscape that's based out in Boston. They are a visualization powerhouse, uh, one of the best that I know, um, and they focus exclusively on architectural visualizations. They make some pretty nice looking stuff. Um, so they decided to take one of their typical data sets through this process. This is a data set uh, you know, of a store, of course, uh, that was rendered in V-Ray. This is the V-Ray equivalent that, uh, that they had as a sort of baseline. And they sent it into Stingray using level sync that I showed you with the apartment a little bit earlier. And you know, one level sync in, everything came through. All of the materials came through, all of the lights came through. They're represented as these light gizmos, all the textures, all of the UV mapping, everything just came through. And from there, we did one simple, they did one simple light bake. It was a very high quality light bake that took many hours, but they didn't adjust anything. Just one simple light bake, and uh, boom, it looks like that. So this for very little input in terms of you know user input or user manipulation of data. This is you know pretty much an automatic process. It looks pretty damn good. Uh, so this is pretty impressive, and uh, they were quite happy. Uh, another couple of examples. This is a much smaller kind of simple kitchen scene uh, rendered in V-Ray uh, through Level Sync uh, with V-Ray materials and all into Stingray, and we get this result. So it's very, uh, it's very, you know, everything came through it and, and, and everything just works really nicely. A couple of other shots from this particular project to show you guys some of the reflection quality that we can achieve in Stingray. Um, and some of, some, some of the sort of metallic-y kind of effects. Uh, everything's PBR based in Stingray, so everything just works and looks really, really nice. Another example of another uh, customer data set, this is a, uh, a truck that was rendered inside of Max, originally pushed into Stingray. This is what it looks like. This is all very materials again. Uh, this was, this was, there was some, a little bit more work done in Stingray to make this uh, look this good. We 
We added, of course, a background. We added some particle dust floating around. We adjusted the lighting a little bit, but the point is that for the most part, this truck came in looking really, really good. All the materials came through and I didn't have to adjust anything. All right, so that's another example. Let's keep going here and talk about VR. So we talked a lot about um, sending content into Stingray, interactive uh, visualization workflows, immersive visualization, how to set up triggers and how to make things look good. We haven't really talked about VR yet. So let's take a look at that. So Stingray does support most of the popular VR devices that are available on the market. So from sort of passive type of VR equipment like the cardboard, the Google Daydream, and the Samsung Gear VR, we have uh, templates in Stingray for these devices. We also have templates for interactive VR equipment and devices such as the Oculus and, and the Vive. Um, these come in the form, as I mentioned, of templates. Everything in Stingray is based on a template. When you start off Stingray for the first time, you are presented with the um, project manager dialog, which is what you're looking at right now. And then you have, of course, your projects under the My Projects tab, but you also have templates to pick from. So if you don't have a Stingray project to work from, you're gonna wanna start off from a template. Um, and we have templates to do different kinds of things. If you want to do a vehicle type of simulation or a vehicle type of experience with a driving car, uh, you would use a vehicle template. If you wanted just a basic template of, a, of someone walking around the third person view or first person view, I should say, uh, you'd use a basic template. Uh, just like uh, with the car and the basic template, we have templates for VR devices. So if you had a VR, you know, uh, we have the VR gear, the VR, the VR Google template, the HTC Vive and the Oculus template. Uh, so if you create, for example, the HTC Vive template, you give it a path on disk, you're gonna give it a name, and then you hit create, it compiles the whole thing, and then you got your project to start with. And this is where you start bringing in your assets into an empty level. Um, every template comes with this learning level that you see here. And this learning level contains a few kind of touch points to, to see how certain VR interactions are built. Built. Uh, so you can kind of look at these and uh, reverse engineer some of the content on these assets. When you are satisfied with your project, you've brought in your assets, you've brought in your content, you're ready to go um, and create an experience, you're going to use the deployer, which is what we're looking at right now on the right hand side. From the deployer, you're going to give it a destination, a path on disk, you're going to give it a name, and it will compile your project based on what you've added to your project. Uh, so let's go ahead and just do that. And then you see that it creates this folder with all the DLLs that it needs to run the executable and the EXE. Double click the EXE, here's your project. All right, so we've made no adjustments. This is like a template with the learning level and we compile the learning level. Like that's all, all we did in this particular uh, workflow here. If I wanted to have a template for the, or you know, create an, an experience for the Oculus, I would start off with an Oculus template. It's got all of the necessary you know, DLLs and files that, that would work with the Oculus. Uh, same thing, it's got a learning level. And uh, what's really cool though about our integration of these, um, our support for these devices, is you can actually output both an Oculus and a HTC Vive uh, runtime into the same folder. So what Stingray is gonna do, here we're gonna give it a name, but we're gonna put it in the exact same folder um, as our HTC Vive uh, runtime. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna look at the folder and find the files that it's missing, the DLLs that it's missing, and just add those. So it won't, it won't duplicate assets or duplicate DLLs, but this makes it very convenient to create both an Oculus and a VR experience uh, in one folder and give it to a customer. So depending on what type of device they have, they just need one single folder, one single zip, and they can run either the Oculus EXE or the HTC Vive EXE from one uh, from one folder that you, you provide them. So this is kind of templates, the way templates work. What we also have, and this I encourage you to try this out if you are at all interested in using Stingray as a VR solution. Uh, we have an online museum example that is available for free. So again, from that project manager dialog, the third tab is the online projects. What you see here is all free. It's all available online. Um, and one of those projects is, and all these projects are you know, set up to do different things and to show you how certain things are set up um, uh, so to learn from, of course. And the, um, the VR museum example is a really great VR learning example. So you download the package, you give it a path on disk, of course. And then when you run it, um, it's basically a much more complete version of the VR learning level that is, a found, that is found in the VR templates. So where the VR templates level had just two or three pedestals with like a baseball bat and a baseball and a couple of things, this guy's got a whole bunch of things in here. So if you run it, 
Um, and something else I'm going to just pause right here and, and, and double down on. Um, all of our VR templates come with a lot of built-in functionality out of the box that you don't have to program, script, or code, or wire up using Flow. Um, and some of those built-in functionalities are teleporting, right? So in every VR experience, every, any modern VR experience uh, today typically has some form of teleporting. It's, you know, if we're talking about experiences for the HTC Vive and for the, for the Oculus that are interactive experiences, they have some form of teleporting. And teleporting typically is the kind of thing you're going to have to script out or create your own kind of teleporting functionality. Uh, with our templates, uh, teleporting comes out of the box included. Uh, so you basically open up a template and you run it, you have teleporting already. Um, and of course, you can modify the teleport look and feel. Uh, if you don't want the green circle with the green dots, you can change that. You can It could be whatever you want it to be, but at least you have a starting point. Um, and this online museum example is really neat because it shows you lots of different examples of different kinds of behaviors and interactions that you can do uh, with our technology. And the idea here is, of course, to look at how they're built look at how these guys are done and reverse engineer them onto your own assets, or at least give you a starting point to see how this stuff is done. It's actually really, really simple. It's basically a checkbox uh, to make something, you know, grabbable or interactable. Uh, it's, a, it's an on and off uh, checkbox type thing. So it's pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna let this whole thing play because there's lots of different examples in here. We're turning on or off gravity. We're grabbing a baseball bat. We're knocking things around. Uh, one of the really cool things that I like about this template or this, this project that I have actually reused in other projects is this color picker. This is really, really convenient. And this is something you can get for free. So we grab this color picker here. We assign a material to our controller and we basically laser point that material onto surfaces. So if I wanted to configure a space, for example, if I was in the condo construction industry and and I was a condo promoter and I wanted to sell my condos and I didn't want to do it on paper and plan because that's how it's always done and I wanted to offer a slightly more advanced experience, this is how I would probably do it. And uh, allowing my customers to configure the space using these types of uh, functionalities or you can have this kind of disc go effect if this is what you're after. All right, so enough with this. Uh, I won't let the whole thing play because it's a little bit long, but needless to say, the online museum example, if you're at all interested in learning how to do some VR stuff and cool triggers and interactions, uh, I urge you to take a look at this. All right, so moving right along. Oh, my clicker is not working, interesting. All right, let's keep going. There we go. All right, so um, this particular example here is the VR version of that apartment scene that we were working with at the start of all this. Uh, just to show you that we did bring it into VR. It looks just as good. It runs just as fast. Um, teleporting, again, part of the template, all for free, all included out of the box. We have triggers in here that we can turn on or off certain things, turn off the TV, turn on the TV. You know, what we saw at the start of all this was basic triggers where we approach things and things happen. Now we reprogram those triggers for a VR experience where I can use the controller to actually make things happen. So that's uh, pretty slick. I can pick up this helmet, for example. It's got full physics. Uh, I can throw it around. I can pass it on to one controller or the other, throw it around my room if I wanted to, and I can keep going. And of course, the, the amazing material and color picker that I absolutely love to configure um, the space around you. So if there was ever any valid use or one of the, my, my most sort of valid uses for VR is to do these kinds of change things and see how these things behave uh, on the spot. I actually just renovated my bathroom uh, a few months ago and I created a VR experience out of the planned renovation way before we tore walls down. And uh, I was able to make some pretty good decisions based on that that I probably would not have otherwise. All right, so let's keep going. So we talked a lot about VR. Uh, it is a pretty big focus at Autodesk right now. It's a pretty big focus, I think, in, 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 you know, in most industries. Um, but we haven't talked a lot about AR, and that's because we're still researching this, and there's a lot that's coming. I, you know, I can't you know, commit to dates or anything, but I do want to give you guys a sneak peek into things that we're looking at uh, you know, with supporting the HoloLens or those types of AR devices. Uh, but imagine you know, an online library, a line, an online asset store, uh, where you can visualize kind of like Minority Report, right? 
where this is a little bit minority report-ish. So you can pick and choose things on the screen that appears in front of you only that you can see and you can take these assets, put them into your space and see how they actually look and feel and behave in your space. This is what AR allows for and this is really, really exciting technology and this is the kind of stuff that we're actively researching on how to implement. Uh, this is just a sneak peek of the kind of stuff that 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 you know will eventually hopefully come down the line. And um, you know, this is very futurist and very minority reportish, but this is not all that far off into the future. This stuff is all doable right now with the technology that exists. It's all really exciting. All right, so we talked a lot about uh, Max and Stingray and the workflows between those two, but uh, let's take a look at Revit Live. So if you're not familiar with Revit Live, um, it is based on Stingray technology. Um, so, uh, and because of that, it's part of the sort of live design ecosystem. But Revit Live is a few things, um, and I want to touch on what those things are right now. So one, it's a cloud service. We call it the data prep service, and this is really where the value of Revit Live lies in. Um, basically, it takes your Revit model, and this is, of course, a service uh, that is exclusive to Revit. Just want to clarify that, uh, as the name, of course, implies. Um, it will take your Revit model, and it will process it, and it will create a real-time ready or real-time friendly version of your Revit model. When trying to go from Revit to real-time, the biggest hurdle is all the, you know, all the optimizations that typically need to be done by a person, you know, via 3ds Max. Revit Live's core value is that it removes that need and does it for you automatically and does it on the cloud. It does it really, really fast. Um, so it's also a series of applications. Uh, so we have the, the Revit Live uh, editor and the Revit Live viewer, which are actual applications that you run on, on your computer. And then it's also part of what we call the live design ecosystem. It's you know, Revit, Revit Live, Stingray, and 3ds Max. Because Revit Live is based on Stingray tech, um, it's part of this overall, um, this overall ecosystem. So a quick little kind of diagram of the actual workflow. We're going to step back a little bit to see what's going on here. So we go from Revit to Revit Live, uh, which is the cloud service. And on the cloud, we're going to run a bunch of processes and algorithms and, and optimizations on your model and get it ready for real time. So we're going to optimize geometry. We're going to reduce object count, merge objects together. We're going to convert materials because Revit materials are not compatible in Stingray. We're going to automatically animate doors. So when you approach doors, they will open. And when you walk away from doors, they close. We're going to create automatic navigation meshes so that you can auto navigate your scene without actually moving in your scene. You just click somewhere and it brings you there automatically. And it's also going to set up colliders so that you don't go through walls, you don't go through floors, you don't go through doors that are not open. That kind of thing, that kind of stuff it's going to do. It does all that on the cloud. And when that's, once that's processed, you download a file that you can then view inside of the live editor. The live editor allows you to make some minor adjustments to your experience, to your presentation, um, and then publish to the live viewer uh, for either, either of the VR devices that are supported, which is the Oculus and the HTC Vive, um, the iPad Pro, and uh, Windows, of course, platforms. Um, and what I also want to kind of mention real quick is that Revit Live is 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 uh, is a couple of things, right? It's it's very much a presentation tool, right? If you want to present your designs, you want to present your ideas and your projects, you can use Revit Live in a really nice way to do that. But it's also a design tool or a design review tool. We have customers that are using Revit Live to make design decisions and to validate and verify design choices at any stage in the design cycle or any part of the design phase. So early on, all the way to the end, they're validating, they're confirming, and they're, uh, they're checking things in Revit Live from a perspective that you just can't get from a still image or even from a 3D model in your, on your computer screen from, you know, from Revit. Walking around and exploring and going into VR with the click of a button makes this tool very, very powerful for, for, for many things beyond just a presentation. So let's take a look at the workflow, what's involved. So from Revit, um, we need to select a 3D view. So we're going to go ahead and make either make a 3D view or select one if it exists. We have one. And whatever is visible in this view is what gets published to live. So if you don't want certain things, certain components to come in, you need to hide them from the VG editor. So once you have selected uh, your 3D view, you go to the add-ins go live button. And you basically give it a path on disk and you hit go. It's as straightforward as that. There's zero user input. It just takes it and calculates it and pushes it up to the cloud, I should say, puts it in the queue, calculates it, runs the processes on it, and you download a file that you can then view in the live um, editor. 
there are certain things that are not supported. Whatever is not supported will be listed in the go live window and it'll ask you to fix those. For the most part, it'll fix them for you automatically. Um, but uh, for, you know, for the most part, it is a u zero user input type of uh, experience. Uh, once you get down, once you're done processing, you open it up in the live editor, and this is what the model looks like. This, what you see here, is the live editor, and it's based, like I said, it's basically running Stingray under the hood. It just has a much slicker and much simple, much more simplified UI um, on top of it. But this is basically uh, Stingray. Um, so from here, you can of course orbit around, fly around as if you're a god. You can also turn into a person by clicking anywhere on the ground, and now you're walking around. Uh, using the uh, arrow keys. You can also click anywhere on your model to be taken there. This is that automatic navigation mesh that I mentioned earlier. I'm not actually walking through these stairs. The system is taking me there automatically. When I approach doors, they open uh, to let me through. All right. So this is that automatic, those automatic capabilities that come with Revit Live that are processed on the cloud that are generated for you uh, by the data prep surface. Um, we can also um, adjust or access our views. All of our Revit views come through to live. They're displayed on the right-hand side as these thumbnails. Uh, you can click on any one of these thumbnails, thumbnails to fly there or to swoop to that viewing location. You can delete views from here. You can reorder views from here. You can rename views. You can create new views. This is the kind of editing capabilities that come with uh, the live editor that you cannot do in the live viewer. Uh, you can also display those views as these pins that you can click on to be taken there just like as if you uh, clicked on the thumbnail. Same process there. I don't particularly like seeing the pins, so I hide them. Um, and you can also go back into force to orbit view, uh, orbit mode. You can Disable all of your textures. If you just want to look at massing, uh, I mean, that kind of effect, you can remove all the coloring and all the textures from your model. Um, you can also adjust the time of day or day of year based on Revit Sun and Sky. Um, so you can turn into a nighttime shot if you wanted to. You can turn on and off your artificial lights using the L key. All of your um, BIM data from Revit is maintained. If I turn on my info button here and I click on any one of these family objects, uh, I get all of the BIM data associated with that, with those, uh, with those families here. All this is persistent and is maintained inside of Live as well. And um, once I'm satisfied, I can go into this present mode here, which basically strips the UI, and now I have arrows on the left and the right hand side to uh, cycle between the views that I've defined in the view editor on the right hand side. So this is this is basically that presentation style or presentation mode. Once I'm done and I want to publish this for a customer to see, I can create, uh, I can publish to Windows or the iPad. And this file that will be generated, it's a .live file. This can be sent to anybody without an active subscription of Live. All they need is the Live Viewer. The Live Viewer is available for free to all, and they can view uh, your model. So uh, we also have a very uh, slick help overlay if you want to see what all these buttons do. You click on the help button on the right hand side and it uh, overlays uh, the help there. If you wanted to do VR uh, and you have a supported VR device, as I mentioned earlier, we support the Oculus and the HTC Vive right out of the box. Um, you would simply connect your device in, hit the VR button on the right hand side and it goes straight into VR. Uh, zero configuration. This is really, really powerful and lots of fun. And the VR implementation that we have for both devices is pretty slick. You have automatic teleporting with this laser pointer that appears from your controller when you hit the trigger key, allows you to go anywhere in your model. And you also have this really slick uh, mini map that we're about to take a look at that turns you into this sort of godlike view where you can laser point into your scene in any location and go there. Uh, and once you're done with VR, you hit the escape key and it goes right back into non-VR mode or regular mode, okay? So that's pretty much Revit Live in a nutshell, really cool. And this, because it's part of, like I said, the ecosystem and based on Stingray, you can actually take that live file, push it into Stingray, the game engine itself, and now you have access to Stingray, 3ds Max to further embellish, further enhance uh, your project and take it uh, to the next level. So again, why Revit Live, just to summarize this a little bit. Very quick to create interactive and immersive experiences at any moment of the design cycle. Uh, one click to VR, right, or two clicks, one click into Revit Live and then one click into VR. Uh, Revit's BIM data is maintained throughout the process and you have a path to enhance the overall 
uh, experience using uh, 3ds Max and Stingray. Um, and I'm going to uh, actually we're running out of time, so I won't play this back. But I do want to mention that VR and AR are a big deal at Autodesk. Um, we are heavily invested in this technology, and we are opening up VR and AR labs around the world. Um, what I would typically play here now, but we are running out of time, is our VR lab in Munich, Germany, which basically contains all the latest and greatest VR and AR technology, hardware, as well as all of our software that supports these uh, technologies. So if you're ever in Munich, stop by, take a look, and we're building these sites all over the world. So it's a matter of time before it's in a city near you. With that, I'm going to uh, pass it on and open it up for questions in the last two minutes. I'm sorry if we went over a little bit. We had some no technical worries. issues at the start. No worries. Um, yeah, thank you for taking us to the future with you. What a what a <laughs> ride. <laughs> and I'm buying that condo now that you showed it to me. That way. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, send in your questions. Uh, there's a question that uh, goes, any way to publish a scene on a website? WebGL or so? Yes, we support WebGL too. Okay. From Stingray. Yep. And then the question that came just as you were starting off, um, the location looked off between Max and Stingray. The location? Yes. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe the camera angle? Is that what's being asked? Let us know, Our... Matthew. Yes. Um, I'm not sure, but I let's see if Matthew can. There might be a, a camera frustrum difference between Max Max and Stingray. He's saying the location uh, but, of the boom box on the Ottoman. Oh, I don't know about that. I'd have to go back and look at my workflow. Maybe it is a little bit off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah. Um, I don't see any other question. I think we're all speechless. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, can this be combined with a 360-degree cam? A 360-degree cam... Um, I'm going to say I'm not sure, I think. I mean, I understand the 360 cam workflow inside of, you know, inside of Max to create a render. Um, I can't, I don't see why it wouldn't work. You would have, probably have to, uh, you know, custom build that 360 cam inside of Stingray. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, VR camera, for example, inside of Stingray. Uh, but if you know scripting and you are comfortable with that, then there's no reason why that shouldn't work. Cool. All right, this is it then. Um, I'll have to take the screen back uh -huh. to the past. <laughs> Sorry for the old past, uh, you know, uh, configuration, 2D slides. <laughs> and I want, to, I want to thank everybody for attending today. And I want to remind you to visit our webpage at novedge.com, where you can find Revit Live, 3ds Max, and the entire line of Autodesk products at the best price. And for information on the latest specials and new releases, join the Novetch Network on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. And remember, the next, actually in two weeks, we will present a webinar on industrial design and reverse engineering in SolidWorks with power surfacing or RIE. And to watch today's webinar or previous ones, um, Come check out uh, our Novedge YouTube channel and Vimeo channels. Our webinar playlist as webinar for every software taste. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Jose. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.